Good morning. My name is Kev. I'll be giving some announcements this morning. Uh, today at 4 o'clock, we'll be having a deacons meeting, so be praying for guidance for our deacons. Um, this week, the kids are going to a Fort Bluff camp and along with a few volunteers, uh, so pray that God be glorified in that. And also, if you or your kids are going to this um, today from 3 to 5, there are mandatory health checks and luggage drop-offs. Uh, coming up in July, we're having BBS, and July 2nd at 4 p.m. there will be a meeting uh, discussing some things. So this is for anybody that would like to get involved and help out with that. Uh, so please, we encourage you to do that because we need a lot of help with this. Um, and finally, uh, we have an app now. And so to download this app, you can go to fbcdecatur.church. I don't know a whole lot about the app, but maybe you can download it and tell me about it. Uh, with all this being said, let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we thank you for this opportunity to gather in your house. We just ask that you just be with all these announcements, and we just pray that you can be glorified through them. We ask that you be with Jordan as he delivers the message, and just pray that we can interpret it and apply it to our lives. We ask that you forgive us for all our sins. Amen. I'd like to ask the praise team to come forward and everyone else to stand. We'll get ready to sing Redeemed, How I Love to Proclaim It. to his house.
and it ain't clean to you all the way. God, we pray that you be with this offering, go forgive and forgive her, and please allow it to be used to further your kingdom and further the riches of your glory in Christ Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. song of response. I believe the Holy Spirit asks us questions in this song within our heart that we need to answer. So uh, this is a song that I hope you'll take part in and consider the words Is God truly worthy? Let's all stand please. Is all creation groaning? Is. is a new creation coming? Is. is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? Is, is it good that we remind ourselves
give praise to the Lamb of God. Hello, hello. There I am. Hey, thank you, Ronnie. Thank you, worship team. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you. If you don't know me, I'm Jordan, pastor here. Uh, before we get started, we're going to be in the book of Jonah. A few things. I got a card from the family of Phyllis Farber. It says, thank you so much for the kindness and compassion you've shown our family during this difficult time. Your kind expression of sympathy has been a comfort to us, the family of Phyllis Farber. Um, Remember, we mourn with those who mourn, so please keep loving on that family and others. There's plenty, obviously, who are going through it. Um, Caleb, I appreciate you doing announcements, buddy. He said, I don't know much about the app, so we're going to educate Caleb on the app next time. But I want you to know the whole reason we're doing the app is because we want a better communication as a church. We want to be able to let you know what's happening, when it's happening in a speedy fashion, all the upcoming events. If you ever wonder, hey, when is that thing? You can click it, it's right there, it'll be easy. You can do giving through that, you can communicate with your small group or class through that. Um, sign up for events, check in for kids, all that's gonna be through the app. So we're trying to get everybody on board this summer. If you don't want to, it's not a big deal, we'll find workarounds. But for those who are willing, please do. We're gonna drive communication through the app. Okay, so with that said, communication is difficult. Right? It's difficult interpersonally, it's difficult as an organization, like a church. And so we're constantly trying to find ways to, to fix that, that problem in life. So here's a story for you. I've had the same phone for about six years. Okay? So I've been working, I was with an S8 that came out in 2017, and so I know, I know. Um, it would randomly drop calls, you try to open an app and it just took ages, the battery life was next to nothing. I would randomly play like a podcast I was listening to earlier. It would just start playing it, which was scary. And then sometimes it would stop when I'm trying to listen to it, which was annoying, right? So Rachel and I have been having this ongoing dialogue about, I need a new phone. I need a new phone. They're so expensive, though. I know, but I need a new phone. We're trying to build a house. I know. We just had a kid. I know. I need a new phone. Like, we're getting to that point. So we, were, we just kind of talked about it. Well, last Saturday, we were driving to the Ark Museum with the middle schoolers, and Brett asked me to drive because he had to get on his phone and figure out how to get his daughter a new phone because she's in Spain and had all her stuff stolen. So she's okay, they figured it out, but that was Kinsley's situation. So as I'm driving, watching Brett buy a new phone, I'm thinking, I need a new phone too, <laughs> right? Sorry, thinking about me. So when it's my turn, I get on, I see I have a credit on the account and I can get a new phone, okay? So I, so I text Rachel, don't wanna do anything without telling her, I said, hey, but, I need a new phone, I got a credit, I can get it for $700. This is a new, you know, not an old model, a new S23 Ultra, $1,200 phone, I can get it for $700 right now. She goes, so go ahead, I'm going to Costco, but I'll check there and I'll let you know what they have kind of thing. And I said, okay. And, and I, she's not gonna find a better deal at Costco, so I keep looking and I see there's a credit, a special promo, I can get that phone for $400, right? This is a steal. But I don't want to just jump without, you know, telling my wife. So I got receipts. I sent her this text. This is a screenshot. I said, hey, sorry if you're driving. I know she's going to Costco. Just respond when you get there. Looks like with another promo, I can get that phone for $400, right? I'm all excited. This is the text, I kid you not, that comes right back. Meredith, a little baby right here, needs a new car seat too. <laughs> I told Marcus Henry, and Marcus Henry looks at me and goes, I don't think you're getting a new phone, Jordan. <laughs> so, so I texted a little more, and I called her, and I was so surprised to find this. When we talked on the phone, this was what I heard. Hey, babe, you need a new phone. Of course, that's a great deal. That sounds like a steal. We've been talking about this for a while. You need, is that the model you really want? Yeah, well, get it. I'm like, that is not what your text communicated <laughs> when, when I was driving. Communication is difficult, especially over a distance, right? Okay. Um, Rachel and I, we're doing this, this marriage course on Thursday nights, mainly for communication. It's not that it's broken or we're broken, but we want to bolster it, right? We got three kids. It's a difficult season of life, a lot going on. 
because communication is difficult. Throw in distance, don't ever argue through text message. And if you've been there, you've learned that lesson, right? It just, you can't, it's not just the words. It's how you say it, it's body language, it's tone. And, and if you can't see that kind of stuff, you start to infer it. And you usually start to infer it based on what you're afraid of, not what actually is. And you start to question the heart and the motive of the other person. Why? Because communication is difficult, especially at a distance. Okay, why does this matter? Because in a church, we're told to have a relationship with God, to talk to God, who is currently at a distance. It's just the reality. Now, we say he's near and he is, and he indwells us through the Holy Spirit, but it's not what it's going to be one day. Scripture, scripture backs this up. I'm not saying anything at a, at a turn, right? We're at some distance from God. He's in heaven, we're on earth, the Bible says. He's holy. We're not. We're fallen. He's God. We're human. So they're already built in. And then scripture says this kind of stuff. 1 Corinthians 13, 12. For now, we see in a mirror dimly. That's kind of the way we see things. But one day we'll see face to face. We know in part. We'll know fully one day. Right now there's some distance. It goes on to say in 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, we are God's children. Think about that statement. We're God's children. And what we will be has not yet appeared. It's pointing to something beautiful that's coming one day, but it's not yet. We're not there yet. But when we know, but we know that when he appears, when we finally see him, when we finally close that distance, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. Looking forward to it. Beautiful. Close the distance, see him clearly. We're not there yet. There's distance. John 14, 3, Jesus says to his disciples, hey, don't be upset. I'm going to prepare a place for you, and I'm going to come again and take you to myself. So where I am, you can be also, which is beautiful. What's the implication? Right now, we are not where he is, not in the fullest sense. There's some distance, which makes it tough. Because we talk to God and we pray and we hear through him through his word. We, we have the Holy Spirit in us, I pray, leading and guiding us. But again, it's difficult. And when there's distance, you question. You question motive. You question heart. And we do it to God. Communication is difficult at a distance. So throw in our fallen, sinful human nature. We ask for things from God we, we don't need. Right? We want it. We don't need it. And then we get upset when he doesn't give it. We treat him like Santa Claus or a genie in a bottle. And we get upset when he doesn't play the game we think he should. Trying to get our own way. Which brings us back to Jonah. So if you weren't here last week, here's the recap. We started the book of Jonah. It's four chapters. We did chapter one. Jonah's a prophet of God. Back then, on penalty of death, these guys, their job was to preach the word of God to, pe to all people, not just the people of God, the people who didn't follow God. Walk you know, to the guy on the street, walk to the king in the castle and say, this is what God has said. So the word of the Lord in chapter one comes to Jonah and says, I want you to rise up and go to Nineveh, the evil fallen city of the Assyrians, your enemies who you've been at war at for centuries, Go there and preach. That's what I want you to do. Take the word of the Lord to Nineveh, Jonah. Jonah says, I'm out. We got a map. Jonah is told by God to go from Israel, go up to Nineveh, about a 500-mile travel distance northeast. Jonah says, bump that. I'm going 2,500 miles west to the edge of the known world to get as far away from God and God's plan as I can. Scripture specifically says he's trying to escape the presence of of the Lord. It's a futile task, but that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to put more distance because he doesn't trust God and what God's doing right now. Um, so he goes and he tries to sail to Tarshish. God hurls a storm on the water. The sailors get all scared. They try to row back. They can't. It's getting worse. The lot falls on Jonah that they figure out this is his fault. So they throw him in the water, as Jonah said. Jonah just wants to die. While the ship's going down, he goes down in the bottom of the ship saying, just let me die. When they throw him in the water, he's laying there. Okay, fine, just let me die. I don't want to go. And that's when the great fish comes and grabs him. And that's where we find him. In the entirety of chapter 2, Jonah is, told, we're told, in the belly of a great fish. Okay? Now, before we get there, i got to clear the runway already now for some of us. 
do, do I really believe that a great fish swallowed a man like Jonah? Do I believe he could survive in there for three days? Do I believe this part of the Bible to be a fact? Do I expect you to believe it as well? I mean, come on, 2023, do I really expect us to believe this kind of stuff? Let me give you my answer in five parts real quick. Number one, I believe God's word. It hasn't failed me yet. Now, there's plenty in here I haven't been able to test yet, right? But everything I have has withstood scrutiny. And so I believe God's word. And so other parts that I have to take on faith, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust him because he hasn't let me down yet. His word hasn't let me down yet. Number two, please understand Jonah is not written in the genre or, you know, you don't perceive it, especially in the Hebrew, as a, a tale as an analogy, as a metaphor, it reads like it's trying to tell us a historical account. In fact, towns mention a proven historical archaeological fact at this point, and Jonah comes across that way. That's number two. So trust his word. This, comes, this is meant to be read like an account of something. Number three, it might surprise you to know, there, there are reported cases in history of people being swallowed by great fish and surviving. In the late 1800s, this happened to a guy off Cape Verde, but in 2021, this happened to Michael Packard, who was lobster diving and got swallowed by a humpback whale. Um, about, he said a minute and a half later, this whale just spit him back out. He was actually on the Jimmy Kimmel show. So there he is. He was swallowed and got kicked out. He's on the Jimmy Kimmel show, and they talked all about it. And he said, quote, I want to apologize to the whale for getting in his way. I will never do it again. <laughs> he said it was the worst experience of his life. It was awful. Okay, so it can happen, but come on, fully swallowed for three days? Do I believe that? Well, the word in, for great fish here is dag, and it's not limited to what we would call, you know, cold-blooded vertebrae, kind of sea creature. could be anything, for we know. What it means is a great aquatic beast of some kind. 3,000 years ago in Jonah's day, what existed? We don't know. We don't know. We really don't. Um... But let's say it was nothing but whales. Well, here's, here's some scale pictures just to give us an idea. It's not outlandish to think. Jeremy, go to the next photo for me. So there's a sperm whale, right, with a person. You see an elephant down there. I mean, it's not that outlandish to think one could swallow the other, right? And if you, if you don't like that, how about a blue whale? We've got them. That's the big one at the top. You see the little thing at the bottom right there? That's a man. I mean, there's other stuff that seems more outlandish. That, you know, that we could be told. But what about, what about surviving for three days in there? Well, a whale has four chambers to its stomach, and they say, well, the first chamber, if, it got, if somebody got in there, the stomach acid would be rough, it would probably bleach your skin white, it wouldn't be fun, but it wouldn't be fatal. And in fact, the irritant of somebody in there would cause air pockets that could presumably be breathed but this, then they, the debate goes back and forth, but that's so out, unlikely. Why would a whale do that? And could the whale even get the person down its throat? Why would it want to? And the debate goes back and forth. Okay. So it's, it's possible. It's plausible. It's possible, but unlikely. Fair? Reason number four, I believe it. J Jesus believed it. Jesus believed it happened. In Matthew 12, 40, Jesus said, quote, for just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, he says, so will I, Jesus, the Son of Man, be three days and three nights in the heart of the, the earth. Just as Jonah came out, I'm coming out, Jesus says. But he, said, he talks about it like it's a historical fact, which is important because Jesus is God, and Jesus would know these things being God. And this is the last point, probably the most important point why I believe this. The second you invoke God this stops being difficult. For some reason, we read the Bible sometimes from a naturalistic perspective, and we try to figure out, well, how could the Red Sea really part? Maybe there was an earthquake or something like that. It's like, no, a big miracle-working God split the sea in half. That's what happened, right? How could, how could a whale swallow a man and he survived for three days? Well, if it's a miracle... See, I think sometimes we read the Bible the wrong way. We don't read it the way the author intended. It's supposed to point to him. Maybe God was just showing off. It's ridiculous that, that a whale would swallow a man. Well, unless it was a miracle. Billy Graham said this. Somebody asked him, hey, Billy, you really believe a whale swallowed a man? You believe that? 
and he shot right back and he says, sir, if, you, if I tell you I believe Genesis 1-1, that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, you could tell me the man swallowed the whale and I believe you. He said it's child's play at that point. The second you invoke a miracle working God, it becomes easy. Sinclair said it this way. It would do us a disservice to focus so much on the big fish just to miss the big God behind it all. He's just showing off. What I love about this is if you're a skeptic, and I, man, I'm with you, I am. And if you're a skeptic and you read this and you think it's so outlandish that it would take a miracle, well, good news, good news. This is supposed to be pointing us to a miracle working God. And then if you say, well, what does God, so, you know, why would he do? Go to all these lengths, throw Jonah in the sea, cause the storm, cause the whale, then you're asking the right question. We're getting closer and closer to the true miracle in the book of Jonah, and it's not the fish. It's not the fish. God is up to something big right now, and he'll move mountains to do it. Um, one other thing. I love this. So if you've ever read the book of Job, a lot of bad things happen to Job in the first chapter of the book of Job. And then him and his friends for about 36, 37 chapters sit around and talk about God, and they question God. And then God comes to Job, and I'm going to read you just a snippet of how God feels about his ability for things like this being questioned. You ready? The Lord answered Job from the whirlwind. Who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorant words? Raise yourself like a man, Job, because I have some questions for you, and you have to answer me now. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you know so much. Who determined the earth's dimensions and stretched out the surveying line? What supports the earth's foundations? Who laid its cornerstones, Job, as the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? Was that you? Who kept the sea inside its boundaries as it burst from the womb? Who closed it with clouds and wrapped it with such darkness? For I locked it behind barred gates, limiting its shores. I said to the ocean, this far no further will you come. Here your proud waves stop. Have you ever commanded the morning to appear and caused the dawn to rise in the east? Um... He says, have you explored the springs from which the seas come? Have you explored their depths? Do you know where the gates of death are located, Job? Have you seen the gates of utter gloom? Do you realize the extent of the earth? Tell me about it all. Where does light come from? Where does darkness go? Can you take each to its home? Do you know how to get there? Of course you know all this, for you were born before it all was created, weren't you, Job? You're so very experienced. Have you visited the storehouses of the snow or the storehouses of hail? Have you commanded the lightning bolts where to go? He goes on for four chapters saying, who are you to question me? Now listen, I, I told you I'm a skeptic, ask questions, but I think we're off if we start questioning God's ability to work miracles right you know what Job says halfway through he tries to interrupt and he says I I am nothing how could I ever answer these questions I should have just shut my mouth that's exactly what he says I should have put my hand over my mouth I shouldn't have spoke up and then God goes on for two more chapters questioning Job this way and Job answered the Lord and said I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. That's, I think, where we need to get, to get to with this account. If you're thinking, how could this happen? Mm, easy, easy. It would be a miracle. That's fine. I hope you go there. Because that miracle points you right to the miracle working God who's behind something big in Jonah. Amen? Okay, with that said, the runway cleared on that point. This is where we find ourselves. We're about to pray and we're going to read the word. We've got a man, a prophet who's reluctant, disobedient, in the belly of a fish, being carried back to the mission he tried to abandon by this fish on the orders of God himself. In that moment, Jonah's in the belly of this fish, scared, broken, sorry, seaweed wrapped around his head, bleached by stomach acid, alone, no hope. And he does the one thing he has left. Can you guess? gets down, and he prays. That's what we're going to read. Uh, if you would stand with me, please. Jonah chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, 
I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol, out of death, I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the sea, and you, the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Next slide, please. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I didn't make that up. It's in there. At the roots of the mountain. This is deep. This is down low. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. As God's word for God's people, hear it, believe it, and live. Before you sit, let's pray. Lord, we come to you today. We want to hear from you, God. Hear from your word. We are not here to play church. We are here, here to have an encounter with the living God who's active and working. Lord, thank you that we can come to you. Thank you that you're worthy. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that you give us your word to lead us, guide us, but ultimately to point us back to you. Please help us to see you in it today, to be transformed by it and walked out of here for your glory and our good. In your name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Okay. So this is what I want to do real quick. Let's just talk about the good and the bad I see in this. Because Jonah is still learning, and he's got a big lesson still to learn. So let's talk about the good first. First, Jonah prays, and he speaks to God. This is a big deal. This is a guy who is running from the presence of the Lord. Um, but is, he's softened at this point. He's broken, we could say. See, God gave Jonah a mission, a word straight from him. That didn't soften Jonah. That didn't break Jonah. That wasn't enough for some reason. Okay, Well, the sea gets worse. That's not enough. He gets thrown in the water. That's not enough. Three days in the belly of a fish, and that seems to do the trick. He's humbled. He's changed his tune a little bit. Again, we said last week, God, God said basically to Jonah, hey, we can do this the easy way, or we can do this the hard way. Either way, we're doing it, Jonah. So get with the program. Jonah is getting with the program. See, God knows what it will take. For each of us to turn to him, to be humbled, to be broken, to be softened. Um, and it'd probably be a good, good question to ask yourself as we go through this chapter. When's the last time you spoke to God? Not just praying for your meal or, you know, something real quick. When's the last time you really spoke to him? Because he loves you enough, he will drive you to it. He, the easy way or the hard way. See, what I love about this, as Jonah's praying, Jonah knows God is the one ultimately behind everything that just happened, right? In chapter 1, we we're told that it all starts as the word of the Lord came to Jonah. God worked. In 1.4, it says the Lord, excuse me, the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea. God calls the storm. In verse 7 of chapter 1, we're told that when they drew lots, lo and behold, it fell on Jonah. I believe God was behind that. And, you know, they sniffed out who was the problem here. In verse 15 of chapter 1, it says the sailors picked up Jonah and they hurled him into the sea because they had no other recourse. And they prayed and repented to God as they did it. Yet in verse 3 of chapter 2, Jonah says, For you cast me into the deep. This was you, God. I know you're behind it all. I know you will not stop. You will chase me. You will break me into the heart of the sea. The, your waves, your billows passed over me. This was all you. This was all you because you're up to something big right now, God. And then in verse 17, we saw the Lord appointed the Lord appointed a great fish. It was a miracle to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly three days. Have you considered your present circumstance? Maybe the thing you hate. Maybe the thing, you know, you're crying out to God, and you, or maybe you think God's abandoned you. There's a distance between you and God, and your question is heart and motive. Have you considered that your current situation and circumstance 
There's only two options. Either it was sent to you by God who was sovereign and in control, or God stepped back and allowed it. There's no other option if he's really God and in control. Now, is he the author of sin? Does he, you know, cause these things? No, 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 no. We do that ourselves. We sin, we hurt ourselves, we hurt each other through our sin. But God could intervene, right? So have you considered in the midst of your circumstance that you're so eager maybe to get away from, that he's in the midst of it? That he's teaching you something? That there's a greater good he's going to bring from it? That maybe he's more interested in your heart than your happiness? I know this, this is high-level theology. This is deep, mature stuff. And it's difficult for any of us, me included, to live there. But I think sometimes we need to step back and say, if you're really who you say you are, if you're really God, then this hasn't gone beyond your notice. You're in the details. You know what I'm going through. And yet, you allow it. Why? Why? And that's where we really start to get to the heart of it. Do we trust him? Do we trust him? And depending on how much you trust him is how you answer that question. Why did he allow this? Why did he send it if he sent it? Why did he step back and allow it if he did? Why? Do you trust him ends up being the question. Now, for believers, this is the promise we're given. Romans 8, 28. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. That he is building something beautiful. He's making all things new. And he'll walk us through it. And he's more interested in our hearts, in our eternal joy, than our momentary happiness. We want God to treat us like pets at, you know, in our little atrium, make everything good, get a little food bowl here, make me comfortable. God says, no, 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 that's not what this life is for. That's the next life. I'm trying to get you there. I'm trying to get you there. Jonah realizes this, and he has hope. He says, I am in, I mean, he's in a rough situation, right? He's in a real rough situation. And he cries out to God full of hope because he knows this isn't the end of his story, that God's in the midst of this doing something. He says, I'm going to look upon your holy temple again, he says in verse 4. In verse 6, he says, you, yet you brought up my life from the pit. This is not the end of me. This isn't the end of Jonah's story. And he's praying all this while in the fish, we're told. He prays knowing God is there, that he's with him, that God can and will redeem this situation if he lets him. So again, what situation are you in? What should you pray to God? What do you need to pray? How do you, how do you trust him? How do you trust his love is for you? Jonah's getting a hard reminder of who's ultimately in control in chapter two, and he stops running. What we see is he puts his hope in God, his trust in God, and then obedience follows. It's another good thing we see in his prayer. He says, what I have vowed, I will pay. What has Jonah vowed? Well, he's a prophet of God. He's supposed to go tell people what God says, no matter who, boldly. What is Jonah running from? Going to where he was told to go to tell people what God has said. Jonah says, okay, I'm done running. I'll do what I said. I'll do what you told me to do. I promised you I would. I'm going. I guess I'm going to Nineveh now, says Jonah, right? Okay. What could change if you trusted God, if you obeyed God in your situation, that, if he, that God was in charge, one, you're not, that he was for you, though, that in him there's hope for any situation. I think it could change a lot. Let's look at the bad. Let's look at the bad. One, this is a crisis prayer. This is not ideal. It's good that he's praying to God. It's not ideal how much it took for him to get there ran from the presence of the Lord, trying to go to the ends of the earth to get away from God. A lot of us have lived that way, right? And then, no other option. Okay, I'll pray. God broke him, and he turns to him. Jonah thinks he's dying, thinks he's being punished. He turns to God. He has no other option. This is not the best time to pray. You know what's amazing, though? God still accepted him, even on those terms. As I said last week, disobedient prophet... If, if they lied and stuff came true, Becky was saying this after first service, she reminded me, in the Old Testament, they die. That's what it was to be a prophet. It was a big calling. You don't just stand up and say, thus saith the Lord and, and ad lib. If it wasn't really what God has said, you die. Jonah should be dead for disobeying God, for running, for not saying what God has said. 
It's a high calling to be a prophet. Um, but God's gracious. God not only accepts him as a prophet, broken, fallen man, sinner just like us. God not only worked with him, God is patient. God hasn't destroyed him yet, despite his disobedience. And God will continue to keep working with Jonah, working through Jonah. It's amazing. It's amazing, his grace. He'll accept Jonah even on these grounds, and he will accept you even on these terms, even on these grounds. C.S. Lewis, I got a picture. Check this out. My favorite author. Uh, this is a very, very important room. You know what this is? That is this, the room that C.S. Lewis converted in. Okay? That's where he was working. He said this. I got a direct quote for you. He says, you must picture me alone in that room, night after night, feeling, whenever my mind lifted even for a second from my work, the steady, unrelenting approach of him whom I so earnestly desired not to meet. I was running from God, he says. Yet that which I greatly feared had at last come upon me. In the Trinity term of 1929, I gave in and admitted that God was God. He says, I knelt and I prayed. Perhaps that night I prayed as the most dejected and reluctant convert in all of England. I didn't want to do it, but I turned to him. I did not see then what is now the most shining and obvious thing, the divine humility, the amazing grace of God that will accept a convert even on such terms. He says, the prodigal son he at least walked home on his own feet before the father came out to meet him. But he says, what can we say about a prodigal who's brought in, kicking, struggling, resentful, darting his eyes in every direction for a way of escape? He says, that's how I was brought in. And he still took me. He still accepted me. He says, we haven't even begun to plumb the depths of the mercy of God and I love this line. He ends by saying, I've learned the hardness of God is kinder than the softness of men. Think about that line for a second. The hardness of God, the worst thing that God sent to you or allowed to you is softer than, than the salt, or is kinder than the softness of men. And he says this, his compulsions, his will is our liberation. He's working everything for our good because he loves us. And Lewis says he finally broke me and he prayed a crisis prayer and he was amazed that God accepted him even on those terms. He'll accept you on those terms. This is the heart of God for his people. Deuteronomy 31.8, it says this. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. This is the word to Israel, to God's people. What I love is this, this is quoted throughout the New Testament. Hebrews 13, 5, for one, where it says, you church, you're God's people. And it's the Lord who goes before you. He'll be with you. He's not going to leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. No matter what you're up against, he's with you. I know I mentioned my kids a lot. Being a father has taught me so much about the, the heart of God as God reveals himself as a loving father. There's nothing I could do, that my kids would, could do to make me leave them and abandon them. I always love them. Sometimes it'll be disciplinary or I, because I love them for their good. I want what's best for them, but I'm always going to work for their good. This is the kind of love God has. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 says, love is patient and kind. That's the kind of love God has for you. It doesn't envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It doesn't insist on its own way. It's not selfish. It's not irritable. It's not resentful. Communication is hard at a distance, and we start to question God's heart, and I'm telling you, this is his heart for you throughout scripture. Doesn't rejoice in wrongdoing, rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. This is how God loves Jonah. It's how God loves Nineveh. It's how God loves you. Okay. And, and he proved that, I pray, through the cross. Number two, number two bad from Jonah. It's not just what Jonah says it's what Jonah fails to say. Jonah, in this prayer, talks about other people's sins, yet curiously, not much his own. Failed to mention the whole running from God, disobeying God, would rather die than obey God. He failed to mention that in this prayer. 
The pagan sailors repented in chapter 1, but Jonah fails too. You can hear Jonah's idol in here in, uh, when he says, those who pay regard to vain idols. And he's talking about Nineveh, talking about the pagans out there. And he says, those people, man, wouldn't want to be one of them, Jonah says. Yet Jonah, you've got your own idols. You've got yourself. You've got your hate for Nineveh. You've got worrying about taking care of Jonah and doing what Jonah wants to do. It's why you're in the belly of the fish right now. And so we don't want to do that. Can you relate? I mean, is it easier to pray, you know, about other people, to maybe gossip in prayer requests, or if you do pray? I got an unspoken. You know, God forbid we could just be vulnerable and say, I'm not perfect, and I got something going on I need help with. And sometimes even if it's just us and God, we fail to do that. So what should we do? How should we pray? Because all of this is pointing towards an impetus for us that we should pray. What I love is this question has been asked and answered. In Scripture, it was asked of God, and it was answered by God. They asked Jesus, Jesus, teach us how to pray. And Jesus says, okay, let's do it. Matthew 6, put it up there. Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He starts by saying, you start your prayer by acknowledging God, his sovereignty, he's in control, and his holiness. He's good. He's righteous. Start there. And then submit your will to his, understanding that he's in control. Then you look to him for everything you need, physically and spiritually. Verse 11, give us this day our daily bread. Lord, I have needs. I'm a you know, physical creature. Help me. Help me get through another day in this world, please. And then spiritually, I have greater need. Verse 12, and forgive us our debts. Ultimately against you, I have sinned, God. I need your grace. And okay, you've got it. You've got it. And then, once you receive that grace, you've got to understand the name of the game. That same grace I need to give to others, and I need help with that. This is what Jonah still needs to learn, by the way. This is chapter 3. This is Jonah's story. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. I don't want to be the forgiven servant who becomes the unforgiven servant, right? God pays my debt, yet I look at you and say, your offense to me I will not clear. That's what Jonah's done. That's what Jesus says, don't do. Don't do that. Don't do that. Extend that same grace to others and then look to him to lead you because he's leading you somewhere good. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Jesus says, pray like that. I love this prayer and it models what I usually use as the acts model of prayer. I've mentioned it before. It's just an easy acronym to remember. Go to the next slide, Jeremy. In the Acts model of prayer, you start with adoration, which is worship to God. If you just take two minutes in each of these categories, you get a 10-minute prayer quickly. You're like, I don't know how to pray. I don't know what to pray. Start here. Tell him who he is. You're good. You're holy. You're righteous. You're loving. You're faithful. And then repent. Confession. I'm not. I'm not. And you could spend a lot of time there, Right? For everything you thought, said, and did you shouldn't have done or all the things you should have done that you didn't do, you could real quick just get a few minutes out to God saying, I'm not like you. And as soon as you make that clear, that's when gratitude comes in, thanksgiving, and you say, thank you for not destroying me where I stand. I don't deserve to exist. I don't deserve to be in your presence, God. But you love me. And thank you. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for for all the innumerable blessings I have in life that I just don't deserve. And then, then you can come with your request. I never want to be the kind of person that kicks open the doors of heaven into the throne room and show God my list of to-dos and say, get to work. Right? Sometimes we pray like that. He's gracious. He'll still listen. But I think it's better to to worship him, to confess who we are, to be grateful for all he's already done for us, and then, God, I need some help. And you're the person to turn to. Amen. Amen. He tells you to, to come to him that way. Okay? So this brings us back to the main point that Jonah's learning the hard way. Don't run from God. You don't have to. He calls you by name. He's He's running after you. It's difficult, and I know we want to run, and life's hard, and it's difficult in communication with God, and we start to question his heart for us. And for all that, I say you just look at the cross. Does God love me? Look at the cross of Jesus Christ, where he came down. The king got off his throne, and he died. He died for us. In, in that song we sang, you know, is he worthy? That's Revelation chapter 5, again, where 
John's up there having this vision of the afterlife. And he says, here's the scroll, the, the, the word of God, the gospel, the, the will of God to be enacted on earth. Here it is. But nobody's worthy to open it or to make it happen. And John says, I began to weep. And one of the, the elders there says, don't weep. There he is, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the king who got off his throne to die. God, who loves his creation so much, he died for them. So if you put your faith in Jesus, you can have everlasting life. Okay. He loves you. You can run to him. Don't let the distance let you question his heart. There's one more verse in Jonah. This is where we're going we're gonna to end with this verse. After all this, it's probably my favorite verse in this book. The Lord spoke to the fish, verse, verse 10, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. So last week, I like to think he took his little flipper fin and pointed, you know, to Nineveh. Go, all right, all right. Uh, here's two things I see in this verse that are beautiful. One, God only acted and spit the fish out at the end of Jonah's prayer. You notice this? The order of things. He gets swallowed. He's in there three days. He prays, and the Lord spoke to the fish and spit him out. I don't know how long they were there. I don't know how long it took for the fish to swim there, but it wasn't until after Jonah's prayer. And we can see this with parenting, right? You don't want to spoil a child by rewarding bad behavior. You want to teach good. God didn't command a change in Jonah's situation until there was a change in Jonah's heart. That's what he's really after. Jonah's heart changes. Okay, let's go. I love this. He didn't give up on him. He waited patiently. He'll do that. Tony Evans said, but be warned, easy way or the hard way. He says, it can get messy if the hound of heaven has to pursue you because of rebellion. He will track you down, and he will outlast you. And that's what Jonah just found out, but I love it. Jonah, Jonah responds to God, and God acts. Okay, that's number one. Number two of this verse that I love, last thing. I love that it says the Lord spoke to the fish. The word of God is a big deal in Scripture. It's powerful, Right? And I just want you to think about this language. Didn't command him. It's not, not the Hebrew word used, right? It wasn't a distant, far away. It was, like, just imagine what this sounded like. Hey, buddy, you're a good boy. You're a good boy. Good, you know, spin him up, spin him up. Once to the shore, throw him up. Like, that's the language used. This kind of close communication. And it makes me think, God made his creation. He knows his creation. He loves his creation. Think of just the creativity we see in, in nature, right? The amazing things God has done. When you look out into the universe, when you look down into the cell and things like that at the atomic level, the amazing things it reveals about God. And I, I believe he, he made it all and he, he loves, he loves it all. All creatures great and small. And this hits home this week. So some of you saw on Facebook, we, uh, we had to say goodbye to our friend Heisenberg. So he was diagnosed with bone cancer uh, kind of the end of the year last year. And we were told he'd have, you know, two to ten months, somewhere in there. There's nothing they could do. It just kind of slowly start to shut him down. Rachel and I said, well, you know, we don't want him to suffer. Same conversation you have. And so when he can't take care of himself, he can't get around. If he's in pain, then you do what you got to do. Well... I think it was Monday, yeah, his hips went out. He couldn't really get up. He had messed himself a few times, and he was, he was in pain. It seemed that the end, even before, you know, he got the shot, like his body was just shutting down. And so it was hard. It was hard. Uh, we told the kids, um, trying to be strong for them, obviously, and they took it different ways. At first, you know, at Lincoln, it seems like he didn't care, my six-year-old son. But he ran, and he got treats and stuff for the dog as we knew we were driving him to the vet, like, to go with him. And so that was sweet. Madeline had an existential crisis, my four-year-old daughter. And so I went to her, you know, I gave her a hug, and I pull away and look at her, and just tear stained. she says, Daddy, I want sickness to go away. And it's like, gosh, you know, dagger in the heart. It's like, so do I, baby. So do I. What else do you tell her at that moment besides, and that's exactly what God's doing, right? That's where we're headed. That's why Jesus came, to die, so he can make all things new. And Satan, sin, and death will go away. Rachel said she had further conversations with Madeline. I wasn't there, and she started asking about the family and that we're all going to die and who's going to be the first. And it's like, well, all right, all right, let's not go there. Um, so I took the dog, and I put him in the back of the rav on his bed, 
And throughout the day, Rachel and I were taking turns, kind of just taking care of him. He couldn't really sit up. He was just kind of laying. And so I would take my water bottle, pour it, pour it into my hand, and he would drink from my hand. I was feeding him stuff by hand. And uh, we got him in the, there. I drove him to the vet. Uh, Larry helped me. And then he left, and I waited for about 20, 20 minutes for them to come out. And so the whole time, I'm just loving on him. Well, he sat up, and it was he hadn't done this much. And he sat up, and he leaned in, and he licked my face, which, you know, again, just kind of breaks your heart. But then I gave him a hug because I thought we're having a moment. And he, you know, get off it. I was like, all right, you still got your, your pride and self-respect. I, I like it. And so the ladies came out. They said, hey, he's going to get a shot in his leg. He may jump. He may bite or anything like that. He didn't. He just kind of wins, took it like a champ. And he passed with me petting him, telling him he's a good boy. And I love him. And I was a mess. I'm not going to try to act tough, right? It's, it's just it's those moments. It's those moments. And I was sitting there thinking, how much I love this dog. It's, I mean, respectfully, he's just a dumb dog, right? And he was a goofball, right? And I love him. I love him so much. And I'm heartbroken that he's gone. And I think, you know, is that how God feels about his creation? More than me, probably, right? Does God hate Heisenberg died? Does God hate all that? And I think there's, there's reason to think that. Rachel put on Facebook, and Jeremy didn't see it, and he posted the same verse. Here it is, Romans 8:18. 8, Paul says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that's to be real to us. Something big is something, something beautiful. And he says, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God, that God's working salvation through us, and creation's watching is what's being said here. For the creation was subjected to fertility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Theologically, this is what this means, like a barrel of monkeys. As God reaches down into the muck in the darkness and pulls us up, because he's loving and gracious, he allows us, the stewards of creation, to reach down and to pull that up with us. That's what's being said here. Now, what does that mean? Are there animals in heaven? Yes. I think that's pretty clear. Are all animals in heaven? Is every gnat and flea, you know, going to be in heaven? I don't think so. There's room in a new heaven, a new earth, new universe. Sure, we can have them. I don't, think, I don't think that's the idea here. But I love this idea for two reasons. Theologically, and it shows the heart of God. Number one, based on this, the same way God reaches down and redeems us, as he's in sovereign over us, I believe since he's given us stewardship over creation, he may allow us to reach down and to pull others up. And so I don't think it's far-fetched to think the, the creatures that we humanize, that we love, that we make part of our family, and we use that language, I don't think it's far-fetched to think we could see them in eternity. And this is, this is what brings me back to, to the best part, the Father heart of God. That when I get to heaven, and I said first service, if I get to heaven, I, I believe through Jesus I'll get there. I'm just trying to, you know, like the rest of us, that's the only way I'm getting there, is through the grace of Jesus Christ. But let's say I get to heaven, limp in by the skin of my teeth, and I'm allowed to clean the toilets, I'll be happy, right? Just happy to be there, don't want to be in the other place, happy to be there. But that's not the way God operates. He's a loving father. So when I come in, you know, rolls out the red carpet, loves me, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into thy father's rest. Here's all the, the blessings I have for you. No, you don't deserve it. Of course you don't. That's the point, Jordan. Take it. I love you. I died for you. I want nothing but good for you. Here's lost loved ones. Here's the baby you lost in miscarriage. You know, all the, all the stuff. Here it is. Just overwhelmed. And here's God face to face. No more distance. No more question. The father in his heart for me. Man, that moment. That's the moment we're all living for, Right? And then, just because he can, because he likes showing off. Hang on, Jordan, I got one more. And here comes that dumb dog, right? Goose and Jesus, because that's what he did to everybody. How beautiful of a picture. And why not? Can you tell me why not? Why couldn't he, and why wouldn't he? And if he doesn't, I trust him. He's in control. But that's his heart for us, because he loves us. To prove it to you, Jesus, God himself, says this. The same way I felt about that dog, and I love creation, the way God loves his creation. Listen to this. Matthew 10, 29. Jesus says, hey, what's the, what's the price of two sparrows? 
I was looking around like, I don't know the sparrow market. <laughs> you know, what, what are you talking about, Jesus? What's the price? One copper coin? Sure, I guess you could get two sparrows for one copper coin. He says, but not a single sparrow can fall to the ground without your father knowing it. That God's in the details, that he cares and he knows about every creature, including those cheap little sparrows, right? Then he says this, and the very hairs on your head, they're all numbered by him. So don't be afraid. Understand who you're talking to, who you're dealing with. You are more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. He knows you. He loves you. He sees everything you're going through. He knows all the details, and he's with you, and he cares. That's who we're dealing with. That's who we're talking about. That's what Jonah's learning right now. Don't let your sin, don't let your fear, don't let your assumptions about God keep you at distance. Run to him. So I said at the beginning, we're not here to play church. We want to have an encounter with this living, loving God. And so we're going to enter into a time of prayer. I'm going to ask you, I'll, I'll guide it somewhat, I'm going to ask you to pray, to talk to God. That's why we're here. That's why we're here in the grand scheme, to be reunited with our Maker, our, our Lord, our Savior. It's why we're here this morning. Will you bow your heads, please? <laughs> Lord, as we come to you in prayer, let us start with worship. So I just pray that each of us just take a moment in your own words, no pretense, worship. Tell them what you know about it. Lord, you're good, you're loving, you're holy, you're righteous, long-suffering, you're faithful, you're full of grace and truth. condemn us. Rather, when we repent, you're faithful to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because you have nothing but good for us. And you'll help us walk through the consequences of our sin and others' sin until we finally get to you. And so, that leads us right to Thanksgiving. God, thank you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for even thinking about me. Thank you for not destroying me because of my sin. Thank you for being patient with me. Thank you for my family. Thank you for my church. Thank you for another day. Thank you for all the thousand things I've taken for granted each and every day that came from you. Thank you for the breath I'm breathing right now. I'm sure every single one of us could keep going. Keep going. Thank you. Thank you. Finally, Lord, we come to you because we trust you and your heart for us with our need. We don't have to pretend we've got it all figured out, all together. We don't. So we turn to you. We need our daily bread. We, we have things we're worried about, things we're trying to accomplish. If it's your will, God, and I submit it to your will, please help me. things I want. I don't need it. There's things I want and I submit it to you and ask for it. And if I don't get it, I trust you. If I get it, I know it was okay. Remember you were mourning 
you're suffering, go to him. Ask for help, for comfort. Ask for wisdom and right perspective like only he can give. Ask to feel closer to him. That we could trust him until we get to where he is. Lord, I thank you for loving us. Thank you for your word. Thank you that we get to come together freely and talk about you. Not everybody has that. Thank you. Thank you for forgiving us. Thank you for leading us, guiding us, never leaving us, that we don't have to be afraid because you're with us. We love you, God. In your name we pray. Amen. I guess we'll end it there. I don't know how else you go from there. So we love you all. We'll see you next week. And if you need anything, we're here for you. Bye.